Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It's a great pleasure to see so many people filling these chairs. Uh, I know we're all extremely excited to hear uh, Jill Abramson's talk. Uh, it's especially nice to see young faces, to see a group of students here, uh, which doesn't happen all the time, but I hope you're all, that you all feel extremely welcome. Uh, the talk will be followed by a question and answer period, uh, and those of you asking questions, we ask that you tell us who you are. Uh, not at great length, uh, but <laughs> just, <clears throat> just, just so that we know and the people who will have the benefit of watching live streaming and, uh, and the video of the event will also know uh, who you are. Uh, it is a true honor for the American Academy to host the 13th Fritz Stern Lecture. And in that context, we are especially grateful to Henry Arnhold and to the Verlag Seha Beck. Uh, with this lecture series, we honor a scholar who is not only a preeminent historian of Germany and the Germans, but also a founding trustee of the American Academy and a principal architect of the Academy's mission and its dedication to fostering bonds between the United States and Germany, between Americans and Germans. In 1993, it was Fritz Stern to whom Academy founder Richard Holbrook turned when seeking advice and when also seeking a new home for what would become the American Academy uh, in Berlin. Holbrook once said of Stern, quote, he is one of Germany's greatest unintentional gifts to America, and he has in turn devoted his life to helping Americans and Germans understand Germany through close examination of its and his own past, end quote. Many of you will know some of the seminal books uh, that Fritz Stern wrote. Probably the most classic is Gold and Iron, a pioneering study of Bismarck and Bleischröder and the decade uh, we historians call the Gründerzeit. Uh, but to many of us of, of my generation, especially cultural historians, uh, we hold a particularly fond place for the, for the book, not the phenomenon, for the book that is called The Politics of Cultural Despair, which was really, it's from the mid-1960s. Uh, it's absolutely as classic and as powerful as ever. If you don't know it, um, I use my, my historian's credentials to recommend it uh, very enthusiastically. Um, Stern's intellectual focus in that book, uh, among um, many other places, was on the 19th century origins of the National Socialist Movement in Germany, the question, what are the roots, how could it happen, as well as its socio-cultural characteristics. His many essays and lectures uh, use biography quite often as a window through which to view the 19th and the 20th centuries. His biographical portraits of Germans uh, and German Jews, politicians and scientists include Walter Rathenau and Ernst Reuter to Max Planck, Albert Einstein, whom Stern met as a young man, and Fritz Haber, his godfather. Professor Stern was always active in framing this lecture series. Uh, and he advocated strongly uh, for <clears throat> Jill Abramson as the Fritz Stern Lecturer of the American Academy. And in fact, uh, his, this nomination turned out to be his last before his death almost exactly one year ago. Jill Abramson has spent the last 17 years as in the most senior editorial positions of the New York Times, where she was the first woman to serve as Washington bureau chief, managing editor, and executive editor. The Times won eight Pulitzer Prizes under Ms. Abramson, and she won praise for her journalistic initiatives, both in print and on the web. Before joining the Times, Abramson spent nine years at the Wall Street Journal as deputy Washington bureau chief and as an investigative reporter. She is the author of three books, including uh, Strange Justice, which she co-authored with Jane Mayer. She is senior lecturer at Harvard's uh, English department, an appointment she's held for three years, and has taught at both Princeton and Yale, where she led undergraduate writing seminars. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. Tonight, Abramson talks about a topic long debated and now more pressing than ever, the protection and preservation of quality news and information. 
Given the follies of fake news, the spread of misinformation around the globe, Abramson's plea for protecting and supporting a free press and in-depth journalism offers a counter-argument to media polarization and the decline of public trust in the news, but I would also say in general. So it's with great pleasure and urgency that we welcome you. And I wouldn't say the floor, but the mic is yours. Michael, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And I'm really overwhelmed to see so many of you, uh, especially coming out to hear from a representative of the fake news media. <laughs> what are you doing here? Uh, but you know, I, I am especially honored to be giving this lecture because I actually uh, knew Fritz Stern uh, a bit and met him for the, the first time when I was really a, a small school-aged child. And I would frequently be invited to formal Sunday lunches at a family friend's apartment uh, an eminent f physician who had come from Europe and would gather a salon of very notable people at his table. And practically before I could understand what anyone was talking about, I wondered why the question I kept hearing throughout lunch was, what do you think, Fritz? Uh, <laughs> You know, he, he was clearly, you know, so admired and was such a fount of knowledge uh, among these uh, intellectuals who gathered around him and had come from Germany, Austria, and Hungary like him uh, before um, World War II began. Uh, and in the U.S., the, 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 this group of people were fortunate enough to have the freedom to pursue their highest professional goals and to try and find the answer to what had gone so terribly wrong in the world that totalitarianism and demagoguery had almost vanquished freedom and democracy. As we children listened, often squirming in our seats, the adults asked this question, which has gained such new urgency in the most recent US election. Uh, then long afterwards, uh, very long afterwards, when I was a uh, very senior editor at the New York Times, I had the pleasure of befriending Fritz's stepson, uh, Sam Sifton. And oddly, Sam and I had a, a lot in common, including the fact that we had both written our senior theses at Harvard about the same rather obscure topic about in British politics in the 30s. But go figure, somehow I mentioned these lovely old lunches and Sam arranged for Fritz and I to have lunch together once again at, at the New York Times. So um, besides uh, my, my acquaintance with him has almost nothing to do with the fact that he was a historian and I was the editor of the New York Times. It was really all about lunch. Uh, <laughs> You know, and, and it's really su such a shame that Fritz died before the, the end of the 2016 election. I vividly remember when we had lunch at the Times, we talked about Obama had just uh, won, and we talked about, you know, the dawn of a, a new major coalition of democratic liberals that might, because of population changes in the country and new immigration patterns, might actually be creating a, a new political era. But Fritz knew better than anyone how quickly things can change. Uh, and and I really wish he, he was still here to tell us what to make of our new, our new president. 
Um, in his first book, which, which Michael mentioned, the, the, the Politics of Cultural Despair, a study in the rise of the Germanic ideology, which was first published in 1961, Fritz stressed the importance of what he called a new type of quote unquote cultural malcontent, who brought quote, the intrusion into politics of essentially not unpolitical grievances how prescient considering what would happen on election night. My Times old Times colleague and great friend, the columnist Maureen Dowd, has called Donald Trump's unexpected victory the last shriek of white men. <laughs> the people full of grievance about their lives, the loss of manufacturing jobs, the fact that their kids go to failing schools, and will have even lower um, incomes than they do, that they are no longer masters even of their own households with women pouring into the workforce. These are precisely the kind of non-political grievances Frit Fritz was writing about. And this time Donald Trump was their vessel. No one yet knows whether this is the last gasp of old frustrations or some new reordering of American politics. Fritz focused on the role of the intellectual, of the intellectuals here in Germany of creating the climate and framework for totalitarianism. Today I believe, unfortunately, that the new technologies of the internet, which had so much promise until really recently, to connect the world, to democratize information, and create common understanding has instead fueled extremism and helped polarize the electorate. The advent of so-called fake news is simply a, simple, a, a symptom of this polarization, where common agreement over what constitutes a verified fact has been lost. And people who want to exploit the extremes or simply make money off of it manufacture false news story, stories. Many of them have explosive headlines and are worn like masks at a masquerade ball in order to make these fake stories go viral. And I wanted to show you uh, one of them. Um, th this comes from um, a, 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 a pretty terrible uh, website called Danger in Play that is operated by um, Mike Cernovet, who's very, very close to, to Trump uh, and, and has interviewed him. And the, this story concerns when um, Hillary Clinton stumbled and seemed to lose consciousness at a 9-11 ceremony where it ended up she had pneumonia. But here you see Hillary Clinton has Parkinson's disease, physician confirms. Uh, clickbait, you know, attracted a big, big audience. Uh, not even a, as absurd as uh, fake news about Hillary would get as the election went, loomed, where there's, a, there's actually news coverage, and many stories about a supposed pedophile ring that was being run by Hillary Clinton and some of her aides out of a pizza parlor in Washington. I kid you not. Uh, and, and these stories do go viral, and then they're shared en masse by those with a propensity to believe the ridiculous if it conforms to their particular political bias. And so I'm going to spend the next few minutes, yes, talking about the importance of preserving quality news, but, but sharing with you some of my thoughts about the changes in journalism, in technology, and politics in the US that have made the spread of information so toxic of late. Uh, and I'll start with very recent history that I'm calling the 10 days that shook the world. They aren't the 10 days that shook the world that most of you historians know already. Uh, they're the past 10 days. And if you were reading recent press accounts in the New York Times or the Washington Post, you'd think that America was plunged into a scandal bigger than Watergate and that Donald Trump was on the brink of impeachment. It's possible, of course, but if Fritz were here, I think he'd be saying 
not so fast. Uh, if you are watching Fox News Channel or reading the new so-called alt-right media, you would conclude that Trump was a victim of what he has called a witch hunt. The internet brought us the 24-7 news cycle, which has become so fast and overheated that the coverage seems like it's hyperventilating, produced by journalists who are at once exhilarated by the hunt and exhausted by their work pace, as well as now the Vesuvius-like eruptions from the White House and the President that occur several times a day. Momentary flashes and new scoops flow into each other, kind of like hot lava, exhausting most people who would rather just turn it off and, and get rid of all of the political smoke. That leaves a still sizable audience of political junkies who eat up every new twist, an addiction not unlike the hold of a soap opera on its audience. Most of the junkies are on the extremes. Liberal America turns to the Times, the Washington Post, and the Guardian, which has a, huge, a, a very large US audience and for whom I write a political column. The right turns to Fox News and Breitbart, a conservative news site that was relatively unknown until the last election and was headed by Trump's advisor, Steve Bannon, one of the leaders of the American nationalist right wing. During the election, Fox and Breitbart saw their audiences explode because of their singular focus on Donald Trump and support for him. In the golden age of media, when John F. Kennedy was president, he would summon the Times' famous senior Washington correspondent, Scotty Reston, for cocktails, and he'd consult him on policy and whatever problems he was facing. Reston was a learned, cultured man, perhaps not skeptical enough about either this president or the Vietnam War, but still one of journalism's greats. This man, not Scotty Reston, this man is Matthew Boyle. He's a 27-year-old whose only previous experience in journalism was at a right-wing website called The Daily Caller. He is Breitbart's chief investigative reporter and one of the few journalists that Pres President Trump trusts. So there he is, clearly enjoying himself a lot. Duh. I won't make you look at him for too long, however. <laughs> Lately, however, Fox and Breitbart have tried to ignore, minimize news stories, like the firing of FBI Director James Comey, and they've actually fallen behind. Both CNN and MSNBC, Fox's liberal cable rivals, have moved ahead, seeing large audience growth. Though neither side can understand the view of the other, they have something in common. Their interest in or commensurate horror over Donald Trump is making the news media a fortune. During the 10 days that shook the world, the Times and Washington Post both published investigative scoops that drew millions upon millions of clicks, breaking all recent records. Trump stories go viral. Magazines that put Trump on the cover fly off the shelves. This gets the attention of advertisers who then spend more of their money on news. Trump equals profits is the powerful equation that took hold during the campaign when the head of one of the US broadcasting networks, Les Moonves, was quoted as saying, Trump may not be good for America, but he's great for CBS. <laughs> For his part, Trump received more than $3 billion of free media coverage. As the first TV reality star running for president, people could not turn away from him, whether or not they loved or hated him. As Trump stepped up attacks on the quote-unquote failing New York Times, which is one of his favorite tweets, uh, the newspaper added 308,000 paying digital subscribers. That's just since the election. 
And lately, I've found it thrilling to watch the two best newspapers in the US, the Times and the Post, compete. Every time one of them breaks a big story, the other has a bigger one. Some of these stories have been head hand-fed to the papers by sources in the government with an ax to grind. But there has been deep, important investigative journalism, too. The Times recently won a Pulitzer Prize for coverage of the Russian interference in the election. The Post for Trump's phony charitable contributions. Their recognition was well-deserved. Their stories are written under intense deadline pressure, and their reporters and editors still aim for the highest quality and, and the highest level of accuracy they can achieve. Their work is a true public service, the opposite of fake news. But I worry about the lack of proportion. I don't think editors are taking the necessary time to separate the wheat from the chaff or to provide enough analysis and stories to put events into perspective. That work shouldn't be left to historians. I worry that the sheer amount of coverage creates the appearance that the mainstream press is out to get Trump. When you open the Times app and need to scroll, scroll through seven or eight Trump stories to see what is going on in the rest of the world, that's disproportionate. Scandal and controversy are clickbait. Some of these stories are very important, but others are evanescent. And the latter ends up distracting people, not informing them. Uh, you know, and, and all of you, I'm sure, have had this experience, because the majority of people right now globally read news, if they pay attention to news, on their smartphones. And you know, that requires endless uh, downward scrolling. Uh, so you may not even get to the other news. Uh, the first 100 days of any presidency is surely newsworthy. I led the Times' coverage of both the new Bush and Obama administrations, and there were days when there were too many stories, but nothing like this. A new study by Harvard Shorenstein Center has found that Trump has received three times the amount of coverage of any of his predecessors, and that coverage is overwhelmingly negative. Uh, um, there, there's our charm boy again. Um, OK. So that gives you um, an idea of, first of all, the, the, the coverage and its, uh, its tone, where um, I remember the beginning of the Clinton administration. There were a lot of these mini scandals, like tra Travelgate erupting. So 60% is, is a pretty high negative. But Trump at 80 is really, um, really off the charts. Uh, um, I'm not saying that the new administration isn't a hell of a story, but the scandal coverage has drowned out other crucial aspects of the new administration. The slashing of funds for public education, the gutting of environmental regulation, the move to take away compulsory food labeling so that people know what they are eating, what the Republican proposals to replace Obamacare will actually do. His supporters, meanwhile, yearn for any trace of fair coverage of his accomplishments. The internet and cable news create an echo chamber that turn events like Comey's firing or tidbits about Russian interference in the election into wild feeding frenzies. The cheapest way they can do this is by inviting partisan quote unquote pundits to argue with one another over the latest bits of news. There's a giant vacuum to be filled and every financial incentive to keep filling it. If you were reading the Times over the last 10 days, you would be sure that there is, to use Donald Trump's memorable phrase, a nut job in the White House. If you read Breitbart or watch Fox, there's a dangerous coup afoot. When Fritz was writing his first book in 1961, there were only three television networks, and Americans got their news each night from more or less the same place. 
This created a common meeting place for folks in their living rooms across the country. This was sort of in the media's golden age, which began disappearing in the 1990s and by the mid 1990s was already the, the audience for network news was declining in the US. In Europe, there are still giant dominant news organizations like the BBC, but in America, the news media has fragmented. The audience for broadcast news has fallen. Cable does not have nearly as many viewers, and a lot of people have turned off the news altogether. Local newspapers have gone, gone out of business. Regional ones have shed staff and quality, and the few with global reach, like the Times, have been battered by disappearing pr ad, print ad revenue. The long-term survival of print newspapers is highly questionable. Digital revenue does not yet make up for losses in print. This grim picture made the Graham family decide to sell the Washington Post to Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, an internet billionaire. He's actually been a wonderful steward so, so far, but there aren't many like him. Where have the advertising dollars gone that used to support newspapers? To Google and Facebook. 44% of Americans use Facebook as their main source of news, and it has very quickly become the world's biggest and hungriest platform for news. But it does not want to be considered a publisher and has only recently taken steps to crack down on fake news. Google, which owns YouTube, says it's trying to police overly violent videos. Almost every news organization wants to distribute its content to Facebook's three billion daily users. But when articles unfurl, chosen by an algorithm that shows you only news you will like, readers are no longer getting their news from a single trusted outlet where human editors choose a hierarchy of what's important. This feeds a syndrome called the filter bubble, where news is shared on social media by friends, family, and other like-minded sources only. Some say this is democratizing the news and putting choices in the hands of readers, but it also means that, that cit most citizens are paying attention to news. Most citizens who are paying attention to the news are getting only a very narrow band of information that conforms with their pre-established thinking. That means the common ground where people once tried to understand differing points of view is drastically shrinking. The constriction in the number of quality news organizations has fueled fragment more, still more fragmentation of what's left of the industry. Roger Ailes, the founder of Fox News, who died last week, was the master of this new landscape. When he founded Fox News in 1996, for the people who, like him, dug ditches for a living, that's what Roger Ailes did when he was a much younger man, were from Ohio and hated the New York and Hollywood elites. Quote, when Mr. Ailes was done, his network was in first place for 15 years running, wrote Jim Rutenberg, the media columnist of the New York Times last week. Quote, the mainstream news media was divided and weakened, and Fox News was arguably a more powerful force in American politics than either the Republican or Democratic parties. Ailes tapped into the resentments of average Americans just as Donald Trump did to become president. The political system has also cre helped create a polarized, fragmented audience. In the US, in the most recent election, 393 of 435 House, um, members of the House of Representatives stood for re-election, and 29 senators sought re-election. Of those, 97% of the House members were reelected, and 27 of 29 senators, which is 93% won. Uh -oh. The gods didn't like hearing that. <laughs> the only thing an incumbent member of Congress now fears is challenge in a party primary. To fend off such a challenge, a congressman must stick to only what his, his party's base wants. 
For the Democrats, that's liberal, and for Republicans, conservatives. This creates both polarization and gridlock. And I'm just going to quickly show you a graphic that I thought was kind of amazing. Um, now, as you can see, what this is showing you is the purple is the middle. The red are the extreme conservatives, and, and the blue are, are liberals. And between 90, the decade 94 to 2004, there isn't like a giant change. But look at 2014. Uh, the middle has gotten much smaller, and the two extremes much larger. And, you know, 2014 in political years is a long time away from the last election. Okay. I'm not sure if all of you are actually familiar with the term the filter bubble. It's the title of a book written by Eli Pariser, a founder of MoveOn.org and the website Upworthy. It was created by the personalization tools of the web, especially Google and Facebook, that use algorithms that feed users only the information they want to see based on personal information, like what they like to read and how they vote. This means many people only see or get information from news sources or people who see the world exactly as they do. A person who believes Barack Obama was born in Kenya may never see the news that his birth certificate actually says otherwise. Someone involved in MoveOn.org will never be exposed to the conservative arguments against big government. This only stokes a polarized population. It means people can get false information and see it validated time and time again by like-minded sources. It means society no longer operates according to a common or agreed upon set of facts. In the era of social media, everyone can live with the illusion that the world sees things his way because one's personalized pipe of information makes it seem that way. In technology, the age of search reached its apogee in the mid to late years of the last decade. We are now in the era of social, where information spreads through like-minded networks. The Huffington Post grew from 2006 to just recently into one of the biggest news sites on the web by aggregating huge numbers of articles produced either for free or by other news organizations, and then just tweaking Google's algorithm so that its version of these articles ranked at the top of people's Google searches. Huffington Post, then, was reaping the lion's share of digital advertising revenue next to those stories. Although my predecessor at the Times, Bill Keller, rightly called Ariana Huffington a content kleptomaniac. <laughs> she was the success story of the age of search. Then came BuzzFeed. Its founder, Jonah Peretti, discovered the secrets of virality and how to use social networks like Facebook to spread information and news. He is the king of shareability, and BuzzFeed knows exactly what kinds of headlines will spread like a virus. That's how it's, it attracted millions of people to stop doing whatever they were doing and watch a live video, I kid you not, of a watermelon exploding on Facebook. But it does serious journalism, too, and its editor was the one who made the controversial decision to publish the uncorroborated dossier about Trump's exploits in Russia, which now, I read only today, has attracted a libel suit. At a time when a fra fragmented populace distrusts the legitimacy of all authority and institutions, especially the news media. I was just looking yesterday at Gallup uh, every year does a listing by institutions of their level of trust in, in the US. And the military ranks highest in trust. Uh, unsurprisingly, Congress is near the bottom, and the news media is at the very bottom.
the least trusted. But I'm by nature an optimist. And as anyone who was run down by a truck in Times Square, which was where I was mowed down exactly 10 years ago, would be. I'm lucky to be alive and living at such a challenging and fascinating time, something Fritz Stern felt too. He had lived through five of Germany's worst years and then lived the best kind of American life. Although one of his masterworks is entitled The Politics of Cultural Despair, he wouldn't want me to leave you under a cloud of pessimism. He wrote searchingly about Germany's darkest moments and the cultural and intellectual poisons that caused a catastrophic political sickness, but he did more than almost anyone to promote American-German reconciliation, which of course uh, this institute is a very symbol of. And he'd, he'd want me to suggest some things we can do to improve um, our political and cultural life and the news media itself. For quality news to survive and prosper, readers have to pay for it. Reader-based revenue is, far, is a far better business model than advertising. The, quote, news must be free dogma of the early internet must be overruled. The success of the New York Times digital subscription plan is proof that if you create a unique, superb news product with stories that can't be found anywhere else, people will indeed pay for it. Because commodity news isn't valuable, news organizations should stop duplicating daily news coverage, crowding into the same government press conferences to record the same canned statements. Use and pay wire services for this. Focus on original reporting. I think news organizations should collaborate more. Some competition is healthy, but the best news organizations can work together on difficult investigations. I'm on the board of um, a news organization called ProPublica, which is an all-investigative reporting uh, newsroom of about 40 reporters, and they do wonderful investigative reporting projects and find partners to pl publish them. They just, uh, in fact, this coming Sunday, have a piece where they partnered with the New York Times Magazine. They supply stories to some of the local newspapers that can't afford to do investigative accountability journalism anymore. So they have proven that collaboration can work. And I really do think that if the Times and the Post would stop trying to one-up each other each day and we had them working uh, in tandem, we'd have the answer to whether something serious uh, happened in terms of Russian uh, interference or not. In the political sphere, the government has to be reformed, starting with the outline of secret dark money that's almost succeeded in creating Republican right-wing hegemony in Washington, D.C. Lawmakers should be forced to live in D.C., in Washington, D.C. Most of them spend, seriously, maybe three days top. Uh, in the Capitol doing legislative work, and then they rush home, mainly to see their donors, not even to see, um, to see and talk to voters. And if they lived near each other, as they used to during the golden days, uh, they'd actually um, have to see and talk to each other and establish some small level of comedy between the parties, which is a lot more than we have now. We have anger and rage like that, thunder. Voting um, should be encouraged and allowed on weekends to enhance turnout. Uh, in 2016, again, a lot of people didn't vote. Uh, maybe the results would have been different with a bigger turnout. Um, restricted voter laws should be overturned and gerrymandering must be outlawed. In technology, I feel especially strongly that the big social platforms like Facebook and Google, 
They're now the biggest publishers the world has ever known, and they are not neutral platforms. So they can't just throw up their hands and say we're not responsible for any of the content that appears on these giant platforms. And now, because there's been such public outrage, both Google and Facebook have started to, to try to to, to, to find uh, remedies to, to address the fake news and violent content problems. I think they should be required to give financial support to the news organizations that support them. They have sucked billions and billions in ad revenue away from all news organizations, and it's time for them to pay back. If the big tech companies don't show better citizenship and support for the institutions that are necessary for democracy to survive, they should be broken up the way the muckrakers, who were a band of journalists uh, at around uh, 1900, the way the muckrakers forced the breakup of Standard Oil in the last century. These ideas are certainly not a panacea. But positive change usually does come after times of trouble. Fritz Stern spent his life understanding the darkness in order to shed light. And thank you very much uh, for listening and have at me. Uh, we have about the same amount of time for, for questions and I'm happy to talk about the news, to talk about politics, to talk about global issues, really anything that is on your mind. But as Michael said, please briefly tell us who you are. My, you, Ashley, we have, we have one hand, one brave soul. My name is Leslie Collett. I was at the Times many, many years before you were. At an entirely, in the golden age. In the golden <laughs> age at an entirely different level, too. <laughs> I was on the foreign desk and on the city desk in the 1960s. Now, my question is whether the media in America particularly have a certain uh, blame uh, to bear in this entire situation of ignoring the government we know always ignored middle America and the forgotten Americans. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been forgotten. Unlike the situation in much of Europe, these people are paid a great deal of attention to. And in America, they are not. Uh, the media itself tended to ignore them for a long time because they were not buying customers of the media as such. They were badly educated. It's true that the Times certainly has their biggest readership on the two coasts. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, not just the Times, also the regional newspapers simply weren't read by these people who had poor education, who just didn't uh, go for that kind of thing. Now, what? so there is a certain amount of media <laughs> culpitude in this whole thing, I think. Uh, there was a, a lot of lifestyle reporting in all the American media for years and ignoring, you know, that was always the suburbs and the, those who had it in the in, inner cities and so on, but it never reached and never talked about forgotten America. And what are we going to do about that? I, I think that is a, a very <laughs> fair point, and it's very nice to meet a fellow Times person, though we didn't overlap. I should recognize briefly that Alison Smale, the very wonderful uh, Times correspondent who covers Germany and much of Europe for the Times, is here tonight. Uh, and those of you who don't know her should meet her. But it's a it's a, a fair point, and the 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 Times has in fits and starts tried to address that problem because you know periodically the new the the mainstream news media is reminded of the fact that they ignore um, middle America and the quote unquote forgotten man and you're right it I think in large part it's because that isn't the base of 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 readers uh, but 
certainly, you know, I remember I was at the Wall Street Journal after Newt Gingrich and the Republicans took the House in 94, and the same kinds of things were said, Why, you know, because it was unexpected. Like, why were we so surprised by this? Uh, and, you know, that was... Could, that year was called, you know, the the War of Angry White Men. So similar, uh, but then you know, so reporters usually from Washington would be told go out in the country and spend time with quote unquote real people, uh, which you know I I I think all newspapers. Uh, that can afford to have correspondents traveling should absolutely do more of. And when the Republicans retook the Senate during President Obama's first term, you know, they, they overwhelmingly retook the Senate. You know, again, middle America was very angry at the new president. Uh, we, um, we had new bureaus in um, Kansas City and Phoenix in an effort to actually, you know, live among, live, have bureaus right in the middle besides Chicago, which is really a big urban bureau. And now I know, again, um, that beats at the Times have been reshuffled so that more of the national correspondents are going around to, to different places. Evidently, there is, I thought this is hilarious, uh, there, evidently there's one coffee shop in Kentucky, which, you know, it's convenient because it's the East Coast, that's been completely overwhelmed by visiting reporters from, you know, mainstream news organizations in New York and Washington and L.A. Uh, they, they all go to the same, the same place to meet real America. And clearly, um, cre clearly that's not good. And what I worry about is on these reporting sorties that you know, reporters for the, I mean, the time, the population of the Times newsroom has shifted radically, even from the years that you were there. You probably knew Arthur Gelb, who, you know, was one of the Times' famous editors, you know, saved the paper in the late 60s and 1970s, and like a number of the senior um, editors at the, the Times then, he had gone to City College. A lot of his peers hadn't gone to college at all. When he was starting his career as a reporter himself, there were bookies running in and out of the newsroom. Uh, and the big shift over time was that the, the, the newsrooms of America are filled with Ivy League graduates. Uh, you know, I'm one of them. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there are squads of, you know, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, University of Chicago, you name it. Uh, you know, the, the, the profession of journalism has become part of the elite. Uh, why is it so little respected? Because the people that you're talking, you, well, it depends on who you're talking. They, I mean, it's not respected by middle America because they hate the elites. Uh, you know, I think the Times is, you know, respected and that, you know, my parents growing up had two, I grew up in New York, had two home delivery subscriptions of the Times. I mean, they held it in the highest esteem and there are still so many readers, both in print and digitally, who cannot start the day without the Times. Uh, it's, I, I think, a, a, an incredibly important, almost sacred American institution. And Hal Raines, who was the e executive editor um, a while back, who I otherwise didn't get along with, he had, a, he said something that's so true, that if the New York Times went away, no one could ever rebuild it. It's kind of a magical place where there are so many incredibly smart, hardworking people who will do anything to get the real story for for readers. But uh, 
you know, it's, it, it's, it's tough. And, you know, A, in the U.S., most people don't pay a whole lot of attention to news. Uh, even the Times, I remember I, I once asked, this was probably in around 2006, you know, how much time do readers spend both with the print paper and on the web? And, you know, the print paper was good. It was about 40 minutes a day, uh, which is a lot. But on the web, it was 40 minutes a month. <laughs> so, you know, the, people are coming in and out and scanning the headlines and scrolling scrolling through and you know as i said in my talk the news media broadly is you know not respected and it's also not paid attention to by most of the country it's you know that that most of all has to change uh, for quality journalism to survive and flourish I'm Dorothy Schneider. I'm from Illinois. A lot of people are sitting around me are also from the Midwest. And uh, for the most part, I don't think we feel forgotten. I think that's uh, the first thing I want to say. Uh, we need to raise our voice. And there are multiple avenues to raise our voice that go beyond subscribing to the New York Times. Um, although I should introduce myself as a subscriber to the New York Times who, when I moved here for um, the semester, um, called up the Times to get online only subscription mm -hmm. and was informed that I have five subscriptions <laughs> to the New York Times. <laughs> All right. So, the New York Times uh, thanks you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I canceled four. Um, <laughs> um, there are many ways of making your voices heard beyond having the New York Times correspondent um, fraternize uh, with us or our, the likes of us in the local diner. Um, and uh, among them are uh, alternative um, ways to publish news on our own and ways to work with local media which is an experience I had as a um, activist in the union which uh, we successfully um, started and brought to a union contract in the last few years. And I was uh, the media director for that, uh, for that union and needed to work with extreme right-wing sources of the news which dominate our local community. Um, it turned out that the local Fox News outlet, highly popular, fair. was the best source of objective news about our activism and actually promoted our cause um, and possibly moved by um, their you know, activist reporting that local newspaper also fell in line. And we were actually able to shepherd the public opinion right. Um, in well, our that, that's definitely Com the good side of the internet. Completely, so. you know, without uh, national attention. Um, and the possibilities for this are really much mm -hmm. larger than they used to be. Did you have so, a question for me? I want to, to, to uh, reflect a little bit on the possibility of working with more with local and sort of citizen news. Citizen journalists, yeah. Um, I think, what, you know, I mentioned the the Pulitzer Prize that uh, the Washington Post won for its investigations of Donald Trump's charities and and you know because he had given unbelievably little money um, away over the years though he bragged that he was so generous and the reporter who did that story um, used social media to ask you know people for information in the beginning he would just get a few you know tweets personal tweets back with with leads he actually what found Trump, one of the the bogus charitable contributions Trump had given was for a six foot painting of himself <laughs> And David Fahrenholt, the Post reporter, was desperate to find out where it was. And so he used social media like anybody seen this. You know, I think it's at one of his golf um, resorts and got the answer back. That's a small way, but I remember when Bill Keller, my, my predecessor, went to Iran during the Green Revolution and 
the the streets became you know too dangerous for obviously Western reporters to be out and about. And again, you know, people on the streets uh, posting what they were seeing, uh, mainly again on on Twitter, were you know direct and very valuable news sources. And, and the times during my tenure, we had several local experiments uh, with citizen journalism uh, about the schools, public schools in New York. We used citizen kind of reporters to, to fill um, the, those blogs with, with news. So I, I'm in favor of it. I don't think, you know, news established news institutions have to have a lock on quality news. They, they don't. Um, it's my former journalist. Um, Recovered journalist. Recovered journalist. The, uh, the New York Times uh, on its website has a line which uh, proposes or actually asks its readers to report if they've seen anything newsworthy that they would like to share with the New York Times. What do you think of that? I mean, I think it, it's great as long as the Times checks the, if they're interested in a piece of information that comes like that, just you need to check it out. Don't just take it and, and run with it. But, but I, th I think that's fine. Uh, and and useful. I don't know how many you know stories that has produced. Uh, many news organizations, including the Times, also have a kind of lockbox, a secure box where whistleblowers can, you know, present documents and that kind of thing safely. Can't be you know eavesdropped on or whatever. Uh, I think that's all good to. Uh, no. Well, a, a tradition of 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 spying, sure. Right. It's interesting, though. I, I was actually disappointed to find out that she had moved back to New York because I was going to visit Laura Poitras, who, you know, was intimately involved in, in the Snowden leaks and was part of the post-Pulitzer team on the Snowden stories. But she came here because she felt so hassled in the U.S. She was tired of being stopped at American airports and searched. And, but evidently, she's come back. <laughs> uh, yes. My name is Frederica Berlinburg. I'm a New Yorker, <laughs> but uh -huh. after 22 years in Germany, I still read the New York Times every morning. Um, my question is, why do you think the media missed uh, the outcome of the election until, why didn't they see this? Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I don't have a facile answer for why the news media miss the election. Uh, you know, I was one of the reporters at Hillary Clinton's headquarters on election night at the G giant Javits Center in New York. And, you know, I had, I had written a 4,000 word story before election night about the first woman president. And I, I was only at the Javits Center to put a little newsy top on the story from the scene. And, you know, at around 9 o'clock, I just vividly remember feeling, A, all the oxygen being sucked out of the place, and, B, watching on the New York Times website as the, the upshot, which is their kind of predictive data um, blog, went from, you know, 80-something percent Clinton, you know, tipping all the way over. And, you know, I think that that the poll, you know, I don't, you know, I, I, I think by saying, well, the polls were wrong, the polls were wrong, I, I worry that that sounds like Times reporter, Ju what Judy Miller said, 
after no WMD was found in Iraq. She said, I'm only as good as my sources. And that's a little bit what saying, well, the polls were wrong. So what? You should have been out in the country and sensed this rising anger and hatred of the elites and, and all of the things that, that fed into Trump's win. And moreover, the blahs about Hillary Clinton, which did not, I mean, you, you would see polls that showed mm, they were a little concerned about her email and this and that, but the Democratic base just did not come out for her, and that's why she lost. It's not Russian intervention. It's that Democrats didn't come out and vote for her. Uh, black votes hmm? black votes. Oh, black votes were not, you know, if you compare to Obama, the black vote, the Hispanic vote, uh, you know, Donald Trump won a majority of white women. Uh, go, go figure. <laughs> but you know, it's just a it, you know the the fault was not you know in 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 the golden days. Actually, before I was even a political reporter, you know, reporters would go to you know sort of bellwether precincts around the country and go knocking on doors and. They don't do that anymore. Uh, they sit in front of computer screens looking at Nate Silver and 538 and all the things that were wrong. So, and, you know, readers, I, I talked about, you know, after Trump kept tweeting about the failing New York Times and railing against the fake news media that digital subscriptions, you know, rose and, and are still rising. But right after Election Day, readers were angry that the Times had missed the story. And they were, I don't know how many it was, I know there were quite a few calling and that there was con enough concern about it that... Arthur Salzberger Jr. and Dean Baquet, who's now the executive editor, wrote like a, a kind of weird note to, to readers that said, we rededicate ourselves to the mission of the, the Times. I think that translated into, we're going to get out there and, 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 and do more shoe leather reporting. Um, yeah. Uh, Ned Wiley, I'm an independent consultant here. I used to work for a German publishing company, uh, a company that calls itself a publishing company. Anyway, the, the business is changing a lot, and that brings me to my question, which is about your suggestion that uh, Google and Facebook ought to be required to s take some of the money that they that have misappropriated in uh -huh. terms of ad revenues for that used to go to newspapers. I don't mean literally steal it out of their pockets. Well, the proposition has been made by. But some yeah, but you can you can get a lot of money by by changing that. They give a minuscule when they take the Times as content and they publish a lot of New York Times stories every day. Not the entire news report. They they publish the entire Washington Post. If they if they choose to, they they have access to full content. But the revenue share they give is peanuts. So you're, really. you're saying they should they should be required to pay a small portion of or the advertising. Or much, you know, they they should have to give. It would be a lot who, 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 who of. I mean, that? news is like a tiny amount of their overall revenue. So you know, it wouldn't it would it would not bankrupt. All right. uh, Zuckerberg. You're, you're absolutely right. The, the, the business model of, of newspapers was to have a lot of ads for houses that you weren't interested in, right. jobs that you would never have, partners that you had no interest in whatsoever. Unless you were the person looking you, for an and, apartment. And one of the 80 million pages of ads that he, right. you basically threw out when you got it in order to get to the news. Yeah, those are called, you know... Yeah. Uh, that went away, and that model Craigslist, is, you know, wiped out those yeah. kinds of ads yeah. almost single-handedly. So that, I mean, advertising overall until recently was the majority of re the revenues at the New York Times, both print and digital. But print advertising has fallen off a cliff, uh, and digital advertising is meh. Yeah, getting um, getting people to pay for something that they were so so to getting reader for free. revenue uh, is turning yeah. a circ you know basically circulation is turning out to be the strong leg of 
of the legacy papers. And I know that, that Bezos, who focused mainly on scale, you know, he wanted the, the post content to, to spread and to get, you know, the most clicks possible. And they actually, many months, had a bigger um, audience than the, the New York Times did uh, on the web. But he, he's, he's trying to strengthen their subscription model because he, he can see that, that it's working at the time. So, uh, it's, uh, 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 okay. Hi, my name is Carolyn Prescott and I'm um, American who lives in Berlin. I, and I'm one of those people who can't start the day without the times. Um, but even with the times, I feel a lot of frustration about the focus on opinion and when so many of those reporters uh, from various news outlets descended on the Kentucky Cafe, they were asking for uninformed opinions in a lot of cases. I mean, people are informed about their own life circumstances, but the questions that I've read a lot of in the Times recently are, how are the people in Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky feeling about Trump? And I really wonder if that's a useful thing for us, and is it and especially when I feel like a lot of mm -hmm. policy issues go unexplored. Right. Like I, I, I would agree that a focus on, on policy issues and getting to issue-wise in people's lives, what is making them angry and unhappy would be more valuable than just what do you think about Donald Trump. Uh, I, I, I agree. The, the issue, I thought you were going to ask me about, a, you know, actual opinion, as in editorial opinion, leaching into, you know, news articles where, you know, the, I think you would find a marked difference reading the New York Times of today versus, let's say, 1961, uh, when Fritz Stern was, was first publishing his, his, his masterwork. And that would be that, you know, the editorials and opinion were strictly on the editorial page of the first section of the print newspaper and uh, the op-ed, the page opposite that. And that was it. And no one would have dared write anything opinionated in the news pages. It was strictly policed. Uh, when I worked at, at the Wall Street Journal, which was uh, 86, well, 87 to 97, um, they were, I mean, the, the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal, I'm sure most of you know, is very conservative. So to be honest, there wasn't that much danger that um, the reporters were going to be spouting um, the company line, so to speak. But if they tr sensed a kind of liberal point of view coming into a news story, not just because it was a conservative conservative editorial page, you'd get slapped on the wrist. Now, you know, the, 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 the profession has changed so that rather than being, let's say, Jill Abramson, of the New York Times, where the Times is the most important part of the equation, reporters are branding themselves. And that's where they're becoming brands themselves. And that's with the full backing of places like the Times or the Washington Post. Uh, there are, you know, many New York Times reporters have TV contracts on MSNBC, which is a very liberal cable sort of you know, talk shows, and 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 they tweet um, all the time uh, about the news, about Donald Trump, and I'm, you know, I understood that when newspapers were no longer really just reporting the news of the day, because when you get up in the morning, you mainly know what's happened. And so news writing changed and became more analytic and forward-looking, trying to analyze and give perspective about what may next happen. But it was never supposed to have outright opinion. And now in, you know, almost everything I read, 
there's analysis, perspective, and opinion, even in the headlines. And, you know, what news reporters who go on cable TV say uh, about this administration makes me uncomfortable because, you know, I think there, there's nothing wrong with reporters coming to conclusions based on the evidence that they've collected through honest reporting, but otherwise they ought not to be, uh, you know, giving conclusions and, and, and outright opinions. And the tweets are, are unbelievable. Uh, and so I think in this branding effort, uh, you know, the, I, I've never believed that there is a platonic ideal of journalistic objectivity. There, there really isn't. Uh, there's the weight of evidence at a certain point if you've done enough reporting. It shouldn't be on one hand on the other kind of news news writing. But what I what I tell my journalism students at Harvard is if you go, if you don't go into a story reporting with a willingness to be surprised by things, uh, forget it. You shouldn't do the story. And if you know the top of the story is just gonna kind of lead to an inevitable conclusion and kind of an opinion. Why would anyone want to read it? No one is gonna want to take that journey with you. So, you know, I I, I think that that too, there's too much opinion in in news right now everywhere uh, on the left and the the right. Uh, I think we have time for what one, one more. Um, yes, yes. Oh, sorry. No, if, if you were pointing at someone else. No, it's all right. You got it. You keep it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, okay, having usurped the floor. No, my name is Seth Rockman. I'm a history professor at Brown University and spending this year in Berlin at Rework, an institute for labor studies uh, at the Humboldt University. Uh, I must confess to some small amount of discomfort uh, in sort of the false equivalences that I, I see permeating your talk. I do not see CNN and MSNBC and New York Times to the American left as equivalent oh, to the I'm way in which saying that, Fox that is to, is I was to the not right, saying that they are. Nor, nor, say, Democratic congressmen worrying about being primaried from the left comparably to Republican congressmen being primaried to the right. Mm. Uh, the number of, of, I think of Democrats. After Bernie Sanders, there's more worry than you might. If you're a Democrat, think. you still have to say the military is great. We support our troops. The police are our friends. This is you're mm. not going to get away from that. But here's my question for you. Mm. My question for you has to do with the way in which we as Americans can come to terms with some harsh realities that may be facing us about our national character, or about the fact that 40 percent of our electorate is basically illiberal, is invested in white supremacy, is invested in uh, oh. misogyny, is invested in xenophobia. And of course we have stories. These people have been ignored. These are expressions of cultural discontent. If we only educated these people and got them away from the fake news, somehow they would turn away from these false doctrines and join us in our national march towards progress. Are we capable, is journalism capable, of addressing a different reality that in fact these features of the American electorate right now are in fact where the American electorate is, not some aberration from what America is supposed to be. I, I'm going to take that as, as a question of, you know, d does the media broadly make that assumption? and? You know, I don't, I don't think, you know, the reporters that I know in the press corps, you know, think that because Barack Obama was president for two terms that the national character rid itself of, you know, all of the the strains that, that you're talking about. And, you know, the... 
the, you know, racism that permeates many places in, in the U.S. is still so evident and I think actually gets quite, quite a bit of, of coverage. I, I don't, I don't agree, I don't agree that, you know, there's a false impression being created that, you know, the national character had become, you know, a kumbaya kind of society. You know, I, I, I mentioned that, you know, Fritz Stern and I sort of talked about that right after the Obama first, first election as a possibility, but not as, you know, a, a certainty by any means. Uh, your point about false equivalency, I think, is, is, is a fair one in, in many respects. I, I agree with you that the, uh, basically the egregious uh, activities of the extreme right, whether it's their, you know, alt-right news organizations or, you know, hate groups and the like that, you know, it's like this and, you know, the, the left is not uh, equivalent. I think, though, any night, if you um, cared to tune in to, to cable, you would be surprised at how, you know, left CNN and NBC have both gotten. And they see, again, dollars and, and ratings in that. Uh, CNN flipped from, you know, Jeff Zucker, the head of CNN, was talking to Trump a lot on the phone during the primaries, but early primaries, but then he never thought in a million years Trump was going to be the nominee. But now, you know, Trump puts CNN in, in the, the same category as the, the New York Times and, and the Washington Post. In fact, remember that one of the first press conferences, he would not call on the CNN reporter and actually said to him, you do fake news. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know they, they have a definite point of view, but in totality, I think, absolutely the right funded and fat with the Koch brothers dark money and you know they've built a whole you know conservative architecture that you know they began building during you know the, the Reagan administration and it's you know a mighty mighty fortress now and as much as they want to scream about liberal George Soros and his millions of dollars it's like you know a peanut and a pumpkin so fair point I, I did not mean to, to draw a false equivalency I just think there are you know some polluted in, inputs uh, going in both ways, but not with the same uh, force. All right. So we'll invite everybody to continue the conversation next door over wine and dessert. But first, let's all thank Jill Abrams.